One of the easiest ways to get started using Kotlin in your Android code base is to convert an existing Java class or file into a Kotlin file. Now this is thankfully really easy, but there are a few things to watch out for. So in today's video, we're going to look at how you make that conversion and some of those caveats to look out for and how you can improve the converted code. So here we have our Java class that we're going to wind up converting to Kotlin. Let's take a look at what this class does. We have a couple of fields here at the top, title and an array of IDs. We have a toolbar. We have our floating action button and we set a click listener. Then we have a method here to parse some intent params. And then once we have our params parsed, then we might optionally set a title if there's one available. And then we're going to iterate over our array of IDs and ultimately call the display users method. So let's now convert this to Kotlin. I'll use the lookup command to invoke the convert Java file to Kotlin file tool. And just like that, now we have our activity converted to Kotlin. Let's take a look at the converted Kotlin code. We still have our title and ID properties, although now they are explicitly marked as nullable. We're still getting our references to our views, though the way in which we cast them to the specific types is different and use is as type name instead of the parentheses typing from Java. We're still calling parse params. However, now instead of calling get intent to pass the intent to parse params, we just pass the word intent, which uses property access syntax to look up the intent of the activity for us. We do the same thing to set the toolbar title We'll notice that array list has a warning here. We'll need to fix that before we're finished. Otherwise, we still iterate over our IDs. Parse params still works much the same way as well. However, the keys that previously were private static final are now private vals on a companion object. And they have this warning indicating that they might be const. We now have a Kotlin class instead of our old Java class. But what now? Is this Kotlin code as good as it gets? Is there anything more we can do to it? And it turns out in most situations, the answer is yes. There is more we can do to improve the quality of the Kotlin code once it's been converted. And so we're going to take a look at that now. What can we do to this converted code to make it a little bit safer, a little bit more Kotlin idiomatic? First up, we want to try to avoid working with null as much as possible when writing Kotlin code. Kotlin handles this much nicer, so when we can, we can avoid defining things as nullable types. So in our case, both of these properties are defined as nullable types. To change this from nullable to non-null types, we can remove the question mark from the end of the type specification. This will indicate to the compiler that this should never be a null value. When we first remove the question marks to convert them to non-null types, we get a new error saying property must be initialized or be abstract. This is because as a non-null type, we need to provide a value. To solve this for now, we can add the late init keyword, which will tell the compiler that we will take on the responsibility of ensuring that these have non-null values before the first time that value is accessed. If we come down to the parse params function and look at get string extra, we notice that this is not guaranteed to be a non-null value. But since title is guaranteed to be non-null, we need to do a little extra work to a check for this. So we'll add the null coalescing operator and provide a default value in case the getExtra methods return null. 
This helps us adhere to our contract that states that our property values will always be non-null. This also means that we know we can use these without having to check for null throughout our code base. If we look at the function signature of parse params, we'll see that the intent argument is specified as a non-null value. So if we go back to the invocation of that function and we try to pass in null, we'll see that we get an error telling us that the argument specified must be a non-null value. So the compiler helps us enforce these nullability rules. Just below that, you might see this warning telling us that title does not equal null is always true. This is because we changed our title property to be a non-null value. So by doing that, it allows us to avoid any of these null checks. So in this case, instead of checking if it's non-null, we might want to use one of the Kotlin string classes built in utility functions to check if the title is not blank before setting it as the toolbar title. The Kotlin string class has a number of these useful functions built in for us. If we scroll a little bit below, we'll also notice that IDs is giving us the same warning indicating that IDs does not equal null will always be true. So to start, we can remove that if check as well. We'll then notice that there is an unnecessary non-null assertion on our IDs property. When you see the double bang operator like this, it indicates that if this value is ever null to throw an exception. In our case, since we've indicated IDs will never be null, we can remove this extra check. So now we're left with a loop that looks very much like what we're familiar in seeing from Java. However, because this is Kotlin, we can actually update this block to convert our IDs into users into something that looks much more Kotlin idiomatic. So let's rewrite this using some of the useful functional operators built into the Kotlin standard library. We'll call the map function on our array of IDs. We'll use each ID and convert that into a user with that ID. And that's it. The map function will return a list of user objects that can be directly passed into display users. Now let's address this warning on our intent extra keys. Well, notice it says that they might be const. Well, what does that mean? That means that because these are vowels that aren't changing, we can add the const keyword, and with that const keyword applied to these that are within a companion object, they will essentially become equivalent to static constants in Java. Now in Kotlin, we can handle this another way. We can remove the companion object altogether and instead define these constants as private top-level declarations that live within the scope of this specific file. If we come back to the parse params function, we can take a look at a more advanced way of making this code a little bit more Kotlin idiomatic. You might notice that we have two expressions in a row that are both operating on the same intent argument. We can simplify this code a bit by using the with function. We'll pass in the intent and a lambda, and within the lambda, we can call functions as if we were calling them on the receiver, which is in this case the intent. So instead of calling intent.getStringExtra, we just type getStringExtra. And likewise, we can remove the intent dot wording when we copy and paste the second line in. If you have blocks where you are calling multiple functions on the same object repeatedly, this can be a nice approach to eliminate that extra boilerplate code. Okay, now that we've gone through the conversion process for an Android activity, let's try something a little bit different. Let's see what the process looks like to convert a parcelable POJO into a parcelable Kotlin POCO. So here's our POJO user class. It's named user, it implements parcelable. We have an ID field, a name, and a nickname fields. 
we have one simple constructor. We then have getters and setters for the three fields. We have generated equals and hash code methods. And we then have the implemented methods required for the parsable interface. So what will it look like to convert this into a plain Kotlin object? Once again, we'll use the convert Java to Kotlin tool. And here is our now generated class. And so this code is fine and it should be functionally equivalent, but there are a number of things we can do with this to simplify it and make it safer. So one thing to notice is that the constructor now indicates that it's no longer being used. So that's something that we'll be able to take care of as we make some further modifications to this class. We also have a number of squiggly lines and warnings in the parsable implementation that we'll be able to clean up as well. Let's start off by cleaning up this constructor. In Kotlin, there's no need for us to define the properties separate from the arguments passed to the constructor. We can do them as all a single part of the class declaration. So we'll move them into the primary constructor right after the class name, and we'll also change all of them to val since we won't need them to change over time. We can get rid of the equals and hash code functions by turning our class into a data class. This will give us the equal and hash code functionality by default. Next up, we want to clean up the parsable implementation. To do this, we want to go into our app level build.gradle file, and there we'll enable the experimental Android extensions from the Android extensions plugin. This will allow us to use the parcelize annotation on our Kotlin class, which will generate the parsable implementation for us. So if we go back to our user class, delete the old implementation, add the parcelize annotation, we'll be good to go. And with that, our Kotlin user class is now two lines of code. So that's it. We've now looked at how you can take an existing Java class convert it over to Kotlin, and then improve that converted Kotlin code to be more idiomatic, to be a little bit safer, and hopefully set us up for long-term success in converting our code base. What things do you look for when converting Java to Kotlin? Comment down below what your process looks like. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time.